So um, I'm now going to discuss things with Carol Narkle, and Carol has been a huge uh, resource teaching on the, the course in person. Um, uh, and we invite her back every year because she's just so valuable. So, uh, Carol, um, you're a very modest person, but try and think why we're so keen to invite you back each year. The module I cover is actually related to petroleum taxation and the fiscal regime for the extractive industry. And it's a quite a sensitive area because despite the very rich body of uh, research and the literature, extensive literature available, it still remains a controversial area because we start from the basic notion of how to divide the proceeds from oil and gas and mining in a fair way. And the big controversy arises from the defining what is fair, because for one party, fairness means something that can be quite different from what another party sees it. Also, another important dimension, which I particularly uh, find interesting in my line of work, is when countries compare themselves with other countries. And here it's quite beneficial. At the same time, it can be dangerous because some people tend to, for example, they look at their own royalty rate and they compare it with the royalty rate in another country and they say, haha, our neighbor is imposing a higher royalty rate, therefore we should do the same. But they forget the other elements, ingredients of the fiscal regime. So maybe in their own country, they have a higher cost recovery ceiling or a lower cost recovery ceiling in the production chain agreement. Their neighbor does not have a cost recovery ceiling. And therefore, comparing a one, one particular instrument to another as it applies in another country can be misleading. And the kind of exercise we do during the course is an eye opener to show them what they need to look at to assess the fiscal regime as it applies to the extractive industry, especially when it's comparing it with another country. Um, let's turn to some current controversies raging in oil and gas. Um, and that is, um, uh, what is the future of oil and gas? The perception that you have today is that the age or the era of oil and gas is over. Uh, given the current debate, the heated debate about climate change, you have a well-established and respectable agency such as the International Energy Agency uh, saying that if we are to meet uh, the climate targets as uh, recommended by the scientists, we should really put an end to investing in oil and gas projects as of you know, next year, we don't need to do, do any more investment in these projects. However, let's be realistic here. If you look at fossil fuel in general, so that is oil, uh, natural gas, as well as, uh, as well as coal, they provide more than 83% of the world's energy needs. These are not going to disappear overnight. I know that there is more investment happening in green energy, but we are still consuming oil and gas in massive quantity. Even if we look at uh, 2020, when the pandemic, the coronavirus uh, pandemic hit, and planes were not flying, the cars you know, were parked in the uh, car park, we were, nobody was going to work. We were still consuming around 75 to 80 million barrels a day. That is quite big. And we're expecting for that demand to be restored to pre-COVID level pretty soon. So the, the consumption of oil and gas is not going to disappear overnight. And that consumption needs to be met by something. You know, investment has to come to allow for more supplies to meet the additional demand. Otherwise, we're going to see price spikes. In this respect, the outlook for oil and gas, and even when people talk about oil demand peaking, when oil demand, let's say, peak at 100 million or 110 million barrels a day in the next few years, it's not going to disappear overnight. It's just, it simply means it's going to um, you know, it's going to decline gradually, and that decline can go over decades. And if we look at various forecasts for the next 20 or 30 years, you can still see oil and gas playing a central role in meeting the growth in energy demand around the world. So in a nutshell, the oil and gas era is not going to be over soon. It's going to stay with us. Yes, the quantities consumed might start to grow at a slower pace and at some point start to decline, but we still need oil and gas to come from somewhere to meet that demand. Otherwise, I fear we might face some serious energy crisis down the line. Thanks, Carol. I was just reminded of the energy minister of the government of Belgium, um, who's very wisely said, um, we, we in Belgium will only produce um, solar energy 
and wind energy, uh, and all other forms of energy we will refuse to produce. We'll just import it. And so I've got two nightmare situations. One nightmare is that uh, a lot of the West copies Belgium uh, and says we'll only uh, produce uh, solar and wind and we'll import the rest. If they do that, um, there'll be acute uh, energy shortages, uh, which will produce a very uh, chaotic politics, the, the politics of um, digging up coal to, to desperately respond to crises, as China is doing at the moment. And my second nightmare is that the, the West will use our power to say, that means we'll close all energy, all carbon energy production in poor countries, which we've got the power to do, but it would be a complete ethical disgrace. Um, it would be also geopolitically very stupid. We hear a lot of statements made by some policymakers across the OECD region in particular, which for me are rather detached from reality. If you're going to stop consuming uh, fossil fuels and instead domestically producing them domestically, but still consume, consuming them and therefore relying on imports of those fuels, I don't think you're going to make any difference to um, the climate cause. What you're going to do instead, you're going to create a new nightmare that is a higher uh, security of supply problem because you'll end up concentrating your import sources in a handful of countries. And one of the main principles for achieving security of energy supply is diversity and diversity of, of course, energy sources, but also of supplies. What we saw in 2021, for example, the increase in gas prices of 600%, I don't I don't think people applauded that. On the contrary, the big, uh, um, ministers and policymakers, particularly here in Europe, said, oh my God, we have a problem. We need to revise some of the green targets we have set and revisit some of the commitments we made vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the energy industry. So the crisis that we saw in 2021 is perhaps a wake-up call of why we need to consider carefully the green policies and the attitude towards um, the conventional sector. In my opinion, Paul, I believe, I strongly believe, given the current state of technology of green energy, whereby you will continue to need some backup for to compensate for the intermittency of wind energy and solar energy. And the second fact that our global energy system is massively dominated by fossil fuel. The only way I can see the energy transition evolving, if it is if it is built on the principle of integration, and when I mean what I mean with that is new fuels with conventional fuels, not substitution. I think talking about substitution is rather premature at this stage, simply because the technologies of the alternative energy, the greener options, are not quite reliable to support the growth in global energy demand, the needs for global energy demand, not only in the rich world, but also in the poorer nations. And one thing that people forget is when you look at the value, let me focus on oil and gas in particular. If you look at the value of the, the, the proven reserves in the ground, most of it would end up going to host governments and their national oil companies, not to the private companies. So this raises a second dilemma that you mentioned with respect to uh, you know, fairness. We cannot go, and I find it not try to go to the poorer countries and tell them, keep your resources in the ground because we don't want to pollute the climate. There are already, in my experience, when I was dealing with governments in, for example, in Africa, there are already calls from those people to get compensated for the resources that they want to keep in the ground. So it's raising lots of dilemma. And I think there are lots of ways we can follow to maintain investments in the oil and gas sector, but reducing the carbon footprint of oil and gas operations. Thank you, Carol. And um, indeed, the, uh, what the uh, Western countries have not done a good job of is reducing their own demand uh, for carbon fuels um, by, by appropriately taxing it. Um, so uh, trying to do everything on the supply side rather than the demand side uh, is really ridiculous. Actually, Paulie, you raised a very interesting point which is close to my heart, that is 
pricing carbon. So if you look at, for example, the USA, they talk about ending the subsidies for fossil fuel and focusing too much on the supply side, but they shy away from instruments such as carbon tax or pricing carbon, whether you know carbon tax or through carbon uh, trading scheme, because they see it as a politically sensitive issue, because at the end, carbon tax is likely to hit more the cons consumption side rather than the production side. And I don't understand when people talk about stop investment or scaling down investment in oil and gas, they are solely focusing on the supply side. But really, if you want to have a solution to the climate problem, you have to think about the demand side, because simply curtailing supply without doing anything to the demand side is simply lead to, is going to lead to an energy crisis because you're going to see prices skyrocketing because there are no supplies available to meet the growth in demand with major repercussions on the economy and on the poorer countries as well. So let's take a, a practical example of a country that might be able to find natural resources, um, but hasn't found them yet. Um, and the president thinks, right, now let's try. Let's try and find it. Um, what capacities does that president need to do? What does he need to build? Or she. You, you have to think about the institutional framework of the country. They have to be clear about uh, the, the, the allocation of roles and responsibilities, who should be doing what in the country. Because one of the problems I faced when I work on a country on the extractive sector is either duplication of roles and responsibilities. So some ministries, two ministries, whether the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Petroleum, or even sometimes the Ministry of Economy, they end up doing the same task and that leads to conflict. And also you have to bring into the picture the state-owned uh, enterprise. So there should be right from the start uh, in the legislation, a clear designation of who should be looking after what. And they should avoid vague um, terminology, which could lead to confusion. I'm here thinking about, you know, many countries come to my mind, but let me take a big country like Iraq. I mean, that we're starting with the constitution, the whole issue between the central government of Baghdad and the Kurdish area, it, the dispute that they had spanning over years relates to um, one vague um, provision in the constitution which could lead to different interpretation. So both parties had different interpretation of the same provision. Um, once you designate who is going to be doing what in the country, you have to make sure that they are well equipped in terms of capacity. And, and here, you do, I think training plays a very big role. Learning from other countries' experiences also also plays a very important role. Um, staying up to date with developments uh, elsewhere and within the country plays a very important role. But I would say, Paul, one of the problem I face also when it comes to the uh, oil and gas sector is that governments tend to look at it in isolation from the rest of the economy. So they lose sight of what's happening elsewhere in the economy. They lose sight of what is needed to support the economy and they put all their attention on this uh, on that sector, and probably they look at it at the main, you know, like a big bonanza that will make everybody rich in the country. Whereas if they look at that sector as being integrated in the bigger picture, in the macro picture of the economy, they tend to have better chances of managing that sector better. And here we're not only thinking about capturing investment, but you have to think about the whole chain including revenue management. So what do you do with the money that will be generated from that sector? Where will you save it? How will you spend it? The issue of sovereign wealth fund, the role of the Minister of Finance in that respect. So all these things, it's a very complex issue, but one needs to have to have this kind of comprehensive uh, picture in mind to be able to set up the right institutional frameworks, set up the right expertise to manage the sector properly and end up having benefits not, uh, you know, not having a sector which will be a burden on the economy. Thanks very much, Carol. I seem to remember you in the class at one stage telling us a statistic that, um, uh, that when presidents announce their top three priorities, um, they manage then subsequently to spend 4% of their time working on those top three priorities. And so a country where oil and gas becomes the big story, um, uh, 4% of the time is not going to build that capacity to cope with it properly, is it? So Absolutely not. It's, it's a much bigger um, uh, thing because at the end, 
and, and Paul, you wrote a lot about it, so you know much better than me about the resource curse. Many people still don't believe in it, but actually it's um, there are lots of examples around it. And I'm not giving you examples here because the list is pretty long. Um, the sector can bring lots of benefits to the country, but it can also be um, a curse depending on how it is managed. And it has to be given the right attention. I come from Lebanon. Um, we've already, we haven't made any discovery yet, and still government officials went on TV and said we are now an oil, an oil, a petroleum country, to use the right expression, because they said in Arabic, and we haven't really extracted, we haven't made any discovery yet. And when, um, and when you hear these kind of statements, you wonder what impact will that have on the rest of the country, because they end up building expectations too high without thinking about the important pillars to develop that sector seriously. Even things such as oil and gas policy or energy policy, they are not in place in many countries which want to develop their resources. So it's much, it deserves much more attention and should be taken more seriously because not just a question of making a discovery and everybody will live happily ever after. Actually, the list of countries which suffered the resource curse is much longer than that that actually turned that curse into a blessing. Carol, you're so right. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, that's, that was really valuable. And uh, as you say, uh, Lebanon is not really a model for, 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 for how to manage uh, what is as yet not even a discovery. Um, uh, it, uh, building up false expectations um, creates a huge confusion and liability because then people start to say, where's the money? Yeah, um, absolutely. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Paul.